Video coverage of the 27th JCT Traffic Signal Symposium is brought to you by Highways News. Thanks to our sponsors, AGD Intelligent Traffic Systems, Clearview Intelligence, PTV Group, Message Maker Displays, Smart Video and Sensing, SRL and TRL. Well, thank you very much, Alistair. Um, and thank you, Via East Midlands. Um, and so... This afternoon, I found myself having listened to lots of things about new algorithms, forms of detection, people playing with lots of stuff. But I've realised that my rather prosaic um, thing about signal design, you actually need some signal junctions if you want to play with all the other toys. So, why am I even uh, bothering looking into high-level signal heads? Well, last year at the, um, the barbecue, the evening before the symposium started, Chris Kennett got up onto the signal soapbox and the megaphone that John was using last night to try and be heard over us. Um, that was used by Chris to basically say that. He was bemoaning the overuse of tall signal poles uh, or high level signal heads at various sites. And we had a chat about this and I found myself thinking, well, do I really know what I'm doing? Um, so to kick it around, we'll have a look at the advice that currently exists. We'll see what the implications of using a high level signal head are. We'll see when you should use one. Can we pin that down? When you shouldn't use one, can you pin that down? And where can you stick your head? So looking at the advice, I'm afraid it is a bit of a trudge through the regs. And I started with an assumption that there wasn't much advice for using high level signal heads. Um, so this is, well, these are the places where you can look, and it's handy, it's all in one place. Um, but I would uh, caveat that by saying, you don't have to use every single one of these because it will be specific to your situation. If you're in a lower speed environment, you, don't, you probably don't need to look at the uh, DMRB things. But uh, Chapter 6 and TSRGD, well, they're kind of baked in everywhere, hopefully. So... A quick look at um, CD109 for highway link design. Now, it doesn't really mention signals that much, but you've got table 2.5 to work out a design speed um, to use in uh, a situation for urban roads in table 2.10, and that gives you your, amongst other things, your stopping site distance. Um, there's a figure 2.1 earlier in the document that you use on rural roads that you then feed uh, into table 2.3 for your layout constraint that then gives you uh, something to put back into table uh, 2.10. And then you've got the envelope of visibility defined in, three, in figure 3.1. So moving into something that actually mentions traffic signals, you've got CD116, geometric design of roundabouts. Um, and so you see in clause 4.7, it wants at least one primary traffic signal associated with a particular movement uh, at the distant, uh, distance equivalent to the desirable minimum stopping site distance. And you've got clause 4.8, which again relates to a primary signal in accordance with CD 109. So that's looking back at the uh, table, um, I think it's 2.10. Um, and so you have to incorporate the object height into the, this uh, figure 4.8. And you'll see that figure 4.8 is identical to figure 7.2 in CD123. There are enough numbers knocking about. Um, and then you've got things looking at the intervisibility zone. And then, because we're dealing with roundabouts, there's the visibility for the circulatory sections, which I will confess I wasn't totally aware of, but other colleagues had obviously dealt with that by the time I'm dealing with a roundabout. Uh, and then for grade separated junctions, well, they are just that, the grades are separated. So unless you're talking about ramp signals, there's no, there's no signal control where, where uh, traffic's going from one grade separated um, route to another, that's when it becomes at grade. But uh, CD122 does give you table 4.5 that, that you use to identify the design speed that you're going to put into CD109. So it, uh, it goes round and round in circles. 
but, the, but there is uh, a method to it. So then we come to perhaps the, for us, the more important bit, CD123 for design of at-grade signal control junctions. And all the action is in section seven. So you have the uh, clear stopping site distance visibility to at least one relevant primary for each lane. I'm surprised it says each lane. To start with, I thought that was a novelty, but then I was, well, if you're on the approach, you need to be able to see it. It doesn't matter if you're in a lane or not. Um, and it gives you options for providing duplicate primaries in higher speed situations. Uh, and then it sends you back to CD109 for the stopping site distance values. And then you get uh, figure 7.2, which uh, will compare the, compare the three uh, in a, a couple of slides time. And then when it talks about multiple lanes, that's when, it, that's when you have sort of offside primaries, double headed or overhead additional signals to ensure visibility from all lanes. So that's one of the, one of the first mentions of um, high level signal heads. Uh, and then the reminder of minimum of two signals should be visible from each approach arm and stop line. I suddenly wondered last night, so at the stop line, do you need to be able to see two signals all the time? Can, can you always see the primary? It suddenly got me thinking. Um, and there's no specific mention of primaries or secondaries in that clause 7.2.2, um, but that's covered in various other places, so there's no getting out of it. Um, and then again, it, the next clause talks about the additional signal head where a driver's uh, vision could be obscured. So this is giving you another reason to provide, not necessarily a high level signal head, but providing another secondary maybe. So these are the envelope of visibility uh, diagrams. You see the original in uh, CD1093.1, so that's pretty standard for anything on a highway. And then in CD116 and CD123, they have their own renamed versions, but they're reversed and modified for the slightly higher object height. And it also defines that you're looking at that across the stopping sight distance that uh, lower dimension uh, on the bottom right there. Um, so traffic signs, regulations and general directions, part six, the schedule, 14 general directions. It tr really trips off the tongue. Um, who knows their way around the schedule these days? Because most of the people I knew who had all that knowledge, the signing gurus, they've all retired. Um, but we do have clause four where Traffic light signals may be placed to face traffic proceeding in a particular direction if and only if at least two identical signals are placed so as to face traffic proceeding in that direction and at least one of those sets of signals is a set of primary signals. So that's really defining things there, I think. And then I didn't mention this in the paper really, but you've got diagram 3000 that is basically the picture of the red, amber, green traffic signal head, and it talks about the permitted heights for a signal head. You've got a minimum of 2.1 metres clearance to the bottom of the signal head. If we're dealing with an area with cyclists, you're looking at 2.3 metres. The centre of the amber, maximum of four metres above the carriageway surface. But then it kind of ignores that and said, we have physical factors affecting visibility. You can increase this to 6.1 metres. And then if you're gonna hang the head out over the carriageway, you've got 6.1 to nine meters, this band of uh, positioning the center of the amber. And I've down the years interpreted that as anything outside of those parameters, it's either not enforceable or you just count it as a duplicate. So if you're providing one at normal height, you provide one at a greater height if you feel the need. Um, traffic signs manual chapter one. Now this did catch me by surprise. Chris Kennett was the one who put me onto it because I'm not totally convinced I'd ever looked at chapter one before. I don't know if anyone else is like that. Um, but it has the clause that uh, reminds you of TSRGD wanting two heads per approach, uh, one of which has to be a primary. And then, surprise, surprise, complex junction layouts may require extra signal heads. That's a shocker. Um, designers should start from a position of providing the minimum number of heads necessary. That's, that's the minimum for safe operation, not, oh, I'll just provide one. 
you have to apply it to the situation. But it says the routine use of tall poles to provide an extra signal head should be avoided. So they're actually giving you some kind of direction on their use there. Uh, and then chapter six, where most of us who do designs are probably living these days. Um, the primary considerations of visibility and clarity, road users approaching a junction, being clear what's required of them. I think that's really important. Sometimes uh, it's, it, there's almost the danger of forgetting that. Um, section three, covering the location of signals. You start with a minimum of two uh, visible heads with at least one primary. Uh, and then we've got uh, more than two heads may be justified, multiple lanes, large numbers of high-sided vehicles. Um, and then there's a mention of tall poles, mast arms as options, and we get a kicking for routinely using more signal heads at standalone crossings than the minimum required. So maybe we're all guilty. Um, so how's that assumption of mine? Um, there is lots of advice relating to visibility. You need at least one primary signal head, at least one secondary. You've got to keep the number of heads to the minimum for safe operation. And the advice specifically relating to high level signal heads is they're an option, but not too often. Well, thank you. Um, there are implications once you've decided to use a high level signal head. Need a big lump of concrete to stick uh, to keep it in the ground, whether it's uh, a nail socket or it's for a mast arm or the, uh, the ultimate horror gantry. I've never had to do one, I don't really want to. Things have to be lifted into position, so you need a high ab, which is the uh, top right photo there, um, at the very least, or maybe you need a crane. High level access through a cherry picker, the bottom right image there. Someone's still got to get up there and adjust the position of a signal head or whatever equipment you've put up there, you might need to protect it, or, or can it be passively safe? Um, maintenance. If it's a structure, you need to periodically inspect it. You might have to book road space. High level access for lamp replacement or aspect cleaning. Uh, that's the consideration. Um, things can be lowered or rotated to reduce the access demands, so the people like um, Hydro or NAL can provide you with uh, products like that. Um, but there are risks to road users and operatives whilst you're doing these things. If you're lowering a pole, you've, you've taken the number of signal heads below the minimum you've decided is uh, required for safe operation. So you're going to have to pick your times as to when you do that. How easy is that structure going to be to replace if someone manages to drive over it? And how healthy is your maintenance budget? Um, so when should you use one? Um, so the fundamental aim, can everyone see a primary signal head? Can they see a red signal? So it might be playing peekaboo above a, uh, an HGV. Are you satisfying your desirable minimum or um, recommended stopping site distances? Now I've shown those HGVs there, but that's at the stop line. If they're at the stopping site distance, they are going to be a lot uh, effectively be above those signal head heights. So that's, that's your um, uh, con consideration. Um, when shouldn't you? Um, so there are some traps. For engineers, we like symmetry. Something's not straight, we like to straighten it. But we also like efficiency, so why provide four of something when you could get away with three? I used to think providing secondaries that were, uh, had high level signal heads. I don't think that was sensible, but now I've seen it, I've seen it done and I can see the point in some cases. On circulatory sections, again, I've seen it used sensibly. Um, if you've got a corridor where you've got two sites in a row, you're gonna have to look at the case for each one and not just blanket tall poles or mast arms or whatever. Now, I've seen louvers included on high-level signal heads as a result of an RSA comment. There were other battles to fight, so I didn't challenge it. It was a colleague's design that I was looking at. But, um, yeah, it's something where you suddenly think, really? But can we rely on driver behaviour? Um, if you're approaching a junction, maybe there's, there should be warning signs on the approach. Um, you're in the middle lane, 
And there's a, there are HGVs on all sides. Maybe they obscure the visibility of the warning sign. If they start to slow down, their brake lights come on. Do you also slow down? You would, wouldn't you? Or do you wait to see why they are slowing? Is that something we can use to not always have to put a high level signal head up? Um, so this joke is wearing really thin now. Where can you stick your head? Have I been wasting your time? Well, I came to the conclusion that you're the designer, so you design it. Um, know what the situation is, what speed you're dealing with, what visibility you need. Will there be some overhead signs? Might indicate the nature of the site, maybe you can use that. Are you satisfied with what you've done? It, the design has your name on it. Is anyone trying to influence you? They may have their reasons for doing so, sites that have been a problem before. And if an accident is a rare, random, multi-factor event in which one or more people fail to cope with their environment, how can we minimise the rare and mitigate for the random? So we have the design standards, you have best practice, perhaps a woolly term, but you can also use input from colleagues, whether they're in your organisation or pe people you know from these events. Um, and so my conclusions are, I think it's ripe for a study. You'd have to be careful what approaches you're um, comparing sort of multiple lanes with or without high level signal heads. You have to think carefully about things, try and avoid symmetry for its own sake and design it. Don't just copy the previous. If, it's, if you're refurbishing and, it, and there are some high level signal heads there, do you need them? Thank you. Thank you, Phil. That was good. Um, I think there was some symmetry with my paper yesterday, actually, as well. So that was good about justifying um, uh, each piece of equipment that you put out. So that was really good. Um, do we have any questions from the floor? Silence. I think. Um, you know, in, in some situations you get particularly, I've, I've done a lot of motorway um, junctions, so where you get situations where you get um, turning trucks on either side, you get this canyoning effect for people in the centre. So um, in those sorts of situations, there can be justification for having sort of gantries over lanes and um, high high level um, heads to give that uh, uh, visibility uh, as people are approaching but um, uh, I think it's a very good point you see in some locations sort of art arterial routes into towns and they've got every single ped crossing has got tall signals on so it stands out from a sea of parked cars on either side so there's, there's lots of different issues aren't there yes um, one of the things I didn't mention was sometimes the near side pole if we're approaching a roundabout that can kind of be snuck round the corner because the approach is flaring out and there might be signs that get in the way or vegetation that gets in the way. So maybe that near side one doesn't have to be the tall pole. It's only, say, if you've got the, uh, if you have a large number of HGVs that would be obscuring um, your, your sight of a signal head, that's when yeah, I think you can really justify putting it Say like one in at the very least on on the duplicate primary. Yes, on the offside. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Um. Yeah, I think that's um, certainly from my experience is uh, quite a useful situation to use them. Yes, right. We have a uh, have a question. Paul Finch, National Highways. Uh, it's more about your statement with the uh, canyon in. Yes. Um, if you've got a multi-lane approach to uh, a three-lane approach, say, and you have got a tall vehicle on the left-hand side, lane one, tall vehicle in lane three, tall poles still pretty pointless because the tall uh, poles are obscuring potentially the signal. Stick extra secondaries up on the roundabout island. Two, two or three, two. Secondaries, one directly in line with that empty empty lane. Because once your lanes are full, generally cars stop behind the vehicle in front of them, well, hopefully. So I think that's why I raised my point about yeah. driver behaviour. If you've got um, lane one and lane three large vehicles and they're braking, yeah. you might not be able to see something, but they're braking. Are you not going to 
take things a bit more yeah. cautiously. Um, sometimes for secondaries, with deflection, you can't always position a secondary that's really nicely visible, and that's but that's the design. Yeah, uh, so uh, yeah, a few, you know, two secondaries that's, spread. That's maybe where mast arms come in because you have to guarantee visibility to a primary. Your roof, then your roof line, you lose it on your roof line. So, yeah. And it, uh, chapter one, it's a golden rule about not putting uh, putting them in. I, I, Chris and I did a bit of work for last year on this. Right. Okay. I've, I've um, got a whole bee in my bonnet about secondaries on roundabouts, but I, I won't bore everyone with that at the moment. Yes, please. Guess who? Hi, Mark. It seems to me that we didn't discuss the role of turning movements off the stop line and the influence that might have on signal head choice and placement. I appreciate that you're time limited and the lights go on down below you, but... Uh, is it something that, that warrants a bit of comment? Yeah, indica indicative and filter and the effect those might have on visibility by lane and, and therefore signal placement? Potentially, but I suppose maybe I was thinking lots of my experience has been on off slips from dual carriageways. If you've got something where the turning movements are being split out, the speed situation is probably different. And uh, you may... I've, I've still put tall poles in situations where you where you are dealing with, a, with, say, right turns and the aheads and the lefts are on, on a different phase. Um, yeah, it is something you have to consider, but I think it comes back to the point, you have to design it. Yep. So, thank you. Okay, one more question in the middle here. Hello, Elizabeth, Fire East Midlands. Something really interesting recently that's kind of made me think about it when I was watching this. I was thinking, in some areas, why have poles at all? So there's a city called Ulu in Finland. Uh, on their cycle paths, it gets full of snow every winter. They can't see any signs because it just gets buried by snow. You can't see anything on the ground because the ground's just gone. So instead, they project the signals right onto the ground. And I was thinking, in areas of Britain that get really windy and you see poles coming down all the time, like on the M62 and near Manchester, you suddenly start to think, well, why have poles at all? Like, is there, is there a way of projecting the signals or the messages you want onto the ground? And I just, because you've taken an interest in poles, I was wondering what you thought about that kind of technology. I suppose you'd have to be able to see it early enough to make your decision to stop or proceed through. Um, if there's a vehicle ahead of you, maybe they're doing that for you. Um, but maybe it comes back to some of the things we see in this morning where it's in car rather than um, physical infrastructure. I think by the time we're with, we're using connected automated vehicles, well, you need street furniture because the vehicles will talk to themselves. But yeah, it's, it's interesting to think, is there some other way of doing it? In, in America, you don't really have poles at the stop line. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, they're all on gantries or mast arms on the other yes. side of the road. Yes, yeah, well, they do have so, large carriers as well. So basically <laughs> four big columns deals with everything, but then their junctions are quite often enormous. So. Mm. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, thank you. Did you say that was in Finland? Yes, yeah. Yeah, their, their driver compliance is much better than ours generally, though, in this country, I think. I, oh, I don't know, I've been there, and you know, there's the same idiots everywhere, to be honest. <laughs> Anyway, um, thank you, Phil. That was really good. If we could uh, show our thanks. Cheers.